All right, I believe this means we are live, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, tech fans of all shapes and sorts and sizes and persuasions. Welcome to another Monday morning tech chat show on the SGGQA podcast channel. I'm Juan Carlos Bagnell. I did that all in one breath and I'm going to breathe right now. <sighs> AKA some gadget guy, the SGG of this horribly, terribly named podcast series. But the QA, of course, stands for question and answer, as I like to make this an interactive conversation on the top tech news stories facing our industry. It's also why I like to hold my podcast on a Monday. It gives us the week to kind of sort out what news was popular. Maybe something broke over the weekend, and we can talk about that. And uh, you know, we can get our feelings in place, and it gives us a little bit more time to follow up on those stories. Make sure we're staying current and not just overreacting to the headlines. I'm already seeing a crazy group of folks here in the live chat. Matt Tyler is going to be silly, and he's going to watch it from Facebook all by himself. Uh, we've got DTNL, Dave Burns, Kyle Ruggles, Mike It Happen, Muppinish, Otaku, Gadget Guy 2020, Charlie Spirit Sung. I'm missing other people. Uh, Viper dropping some fire in this chat. We have a crazy full live chat. We've got a crazy full show. There's a lot. Um, and, and these are stories, like I said, I like to follow up, make sure that we're not just reacting to one outrageous headline. Ads news breaks, there's like a popularity spike, but we really got to keep up with what the ramifications of some of these stories are. So we've got some follow-ups on, on Apple, App Store Policy, Epic, and Facebook. Um, we're going to be talking about Neuralink. We've got a story on, on Twitter. We've got some Samsung stories, um, especially with Samsung services. And then I, we're going to have to do, I, I think we're going to have to do a, a, a slightly deeper dive on the state of Microsoft public relations and how they're handling the Surface Duo rollout, because I think it's a little slice of genius watching how Microsoft is playing um, the online community. So um, I, I, mean, I picked up my mug to take a sip of water and I never, a uh, merch plug. That's why I was holding my mug. Let me take a sip real quick. All right. Just to kick us off, um, I, I actually wanted to start out for just a second before we hit uh, housekeeping. I hope you had a lovely weekend. I hope you had some downtime, some time to unplug, maybe walk around and see the sun or some outsideness. I know we're all still kind of in a crazy holding pattern world over and a lot of us trying to figure out things like work from home and homeschooling and stuff like that. Uh, my wife and I, we had a lovely Saturday night where we watched um, uh, Bill and Ted Face the Music, the uh, the long-awaited uh, third film in the Bill and Ted trilogy that none of us knew was going to be a trilogy, and uh, it was cute. I, definitely not the best movie ever made, uh, definitely not the best of the three Bill and Ted movies, but it was a really charming throwback to some, some really fun uh, childhood memories of films growing up with Bill and Ted, uh, Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure and Bill and Ted, uh, Bill and Ted's Bogus Journey. Um, here's, here's the issue. If you didn't grow up with Bill and Ted being a part of your lexicon, I don't know that this movie works as well for you. You know, I, it, it, Bill and Ted is such a unique property of the 80s where, you know, the script was actually sort of being workshopped. The script was actually being sold and 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 uh workshopped before back to the future then back to the future hits and they start filming this movie and then the production company goes out of business and it kind of sits on a shelf so even though it's a later 80s film it's got an earlier 80s vibe and then bill and ted's bogus journey comes around and it's all 90s and grunge like the two films almost don't fit together it's 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 a really funny kind of little twist on building unique characters from improv workshops and then trying to make them work for the screen and putting them into ridiculous situations. And so to revisit these characters so much later, 25 years later, is a is kind of a ridiculous undertaking, but the entire story of Bill and Ted, the 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 way that they even made it to the to the silver screen is a ridiculous undertaking. So it's definitely in keeping with the other films. I think my only criticism would be is they've got so many shout outs and callbacks to previous films 
that I feel like they kind of run through some story and plot elements faster than they probably should have. Um, the movie definitely feels abbreviated for what they're trying to accomplish, but it's Bill and Ted. I mean, like we weren't talking about high cinema or high art. So if you want some some chuckles and you want some music references and you want some classic Bill and Ted isms, um, it, it's just it's just heartwarming. You know, it gives you the good feels seeing Alex Winter and Keanu Reeves on stage. You just know that they were having a blast being back in those characters, being back in those roles and working together again. So so I enjoyed it. <laughs> Wild Stallions. They even had a a, a, a hard uh, like two camera shout out station, um, which is one of the dumbest inside jokes in all of movie making history. And I love it and I adore it and I think it's adorable. Um, so uh, oh, Kyle Ruggles, R.I.P. George Carlin. Going to miss him. I got to watch this. And, and uh, George Carlin even gets that one special little shout out near the beginning of the movie. You know, as his uh, he wrote the monologue that sort of introduces us to Bill and Ted. And uh, I mean, like everything, everything gets its own unique little highlight uh, if you're into Bill and Ted films. Uh, all right. Let's uh, let's knock out some housekeeping real quick. Uh, let me get this out of the way here. Um, one of the stories that we're going to be talking about in housekeeping is actually I'm gonna I'm gonna keep it for the gadget uh, for the gadget block, the second half of this because I think it's a really important thing to to talk about. But I got a a few things out this last week. It was actually a pretty busy week, so I'm gonna screen share here. Oh, is anyone sorry? Uh, over under for housekeeping. I say this every week. I almost always lie. I'm gonna try and move really fast. <laughs> we don't even didn't even have a guess for the time for housekeeping. Um, it's 9:08 in the a.m. Pacific Daylight Time. I'm gonna be I'm gonna try to be done before 9:18. Dave Burns is saying I can't do it. He's saying 10 minutes over 10 minutes. Let's see. Uh, screen share. Go. Uh, number one. I I think this is a tradition. I'm gonna have to focus on for OnePlus phones. Android 11 desktop mode. Can the OnePlus 8 replace a computer? When desktop modes first came to Android last year, not and not desktop modes. I mean Android's built-in desktop mode. I demoed it first on a OnePlus 7 Pro, and I kind of feel like I'm gonna keep doing that. So when we get a beta. If OnePlus has a an Android beta, I'm going to test out the desktop mode first. But if you want to get a look at what's improved, it's a short video, punchy to the point. You can see where Google still hasn't made this a mainstream feature, but it is getting a little bit better. So some attention was played to the desktop mode. I had a bunch of phone comparisons shot, and two of them got produced. Pixel 4a versus LG Velvet. Hilariously, this was one of the most requested uh, videos that I've had uh, since starting to talk about the Pixel 4a. It was, it was like, how does it compare against a more expensive phone like the Velvet? So I shot a video talking about how two different phones at two different price tiers are probably for two different consumers. I don't really feel like that's a controversial statement. I got a bit of pushback from people who weren't asking for that comparison, but that definitely... Again, it's commentary where we're talking a little bit more about the philosophy of different tiers of phone than we are like, this phone has this many megapixels. This phone has this many giggle flips. This phone is the winner. Because those videos are boring. <laughs> I don't like those videos. And you shouldn't either. All right. And then uh, Pixel 4a versus iPhone SE. Now, this was the video I was going to start my Pixel 4a comparisons with. But again... I love, so I'm kind of playing with people who like gadget videos on this. There's this notion that like, we're going to put a Pixel 4a up against an iPhone SE, and then we're going to talk about where they are pros and cons, and then we're going to call one of these phones a winner. And that's incorrect. There is no winner. The, the two phones, again, even for being similar prices, could not be more different if you tried. And I also, I don't believe that anyone's looking to switch ecosystems, significantly looking to switch ecosystems, because there, there's a good $400-ish phone. You know, the iPhone SE managed to pull some Android folks, you know, like when we look at the sales and we look at who jumped ship. 
but at the same time, it was the only premium chipset phone, the only new lower cost mid-ranger available. So if someone just needed a new phone, the iPhone SE made a lot of sense. But whenever we see more competition in the space, it's basically better for everyone. So when we look at how the iPhone SE came to be versus how the Pixel 4a came to be, that's the conversation that, that I think is really interesting. And then uh, this is the story we're going to follow up in the gadget block, but I just think it's brilliant. I wrote up this editorial, I wrote up this article, how Microsoft is gaming influencers and algorithms with the Surface Duo. And uh, I, I feel like media literacy is a huge part of the tech review commentary that we're not really living up to right now. And I just got to say, this is this is pretty cute. Um, hold on, we'll get this out of the way here. So Dez over at T-Mobile, Ask Dez, you know, uh, you know, he does like those really, really cool product unboxings, literally just retweeted my article. Great take at some gadget guy. My feed is flooded with, I have it, but I can't show you posts. I hope you're all getting paid well to advertise for Microsoft. <laughs> Dez is not messing around. And and I, I think it's, I, I, I got to say, I, I have to admit a little, um, not frustration, just, you know, a, a bit of disappointment. Like, out of all of the things I posted uh, over the last couple years, it's Dez retweeting one of my articles is one of the only things that Michael Fisher has replied to as it pertains to me. I miss my buddy, Michael. We used to have really fun geek debates on science fiction shows, but this is the thing that he's replying to is Dez's tweet of my retweet to act like, I'm the problem with Microsoft's marketing strategy here. So, I don't know. That was kind of a womp womp. Uh, two other things real quick. Uh, we had a... Uh, oh, where did my housekeeping go? I was really happy to join Tank Girl, uh, Miriam Joire. I don't know how to pronounce her last name. I, I can't make those sounds because I'm not... French. Uh, LG Velvet Dual Screen versus Microsoft Surface Duo Pro. Samsung Galaxy Buds Live. Asus Zenfone 7 Pro with YouTube creator Juan Carlos Bagnell. Mobile Tech Podcast 179. And again, every time you, anytime I've been um, on Tank Girl's podcast with Miriam, um, it's almost, it's almost like a most extreme elimination challenge. Like she just thinks and moves and talks so fast through different opinions that it definitely, uh, it definitely keeps you on your toes. And I think I represented myself well. <laughs> I, I think I held on. I think I think I was along for the ride. But like I said, she moves fast. So I'm like, I'm trying to put in like, oh, an LG Velvet fails here. And I'm like, ah, but there's a counterpoint there. Ah, but what about the duo? Oh, but you could talk about this design. It's a sparring match. It's so much fun. Um, I, I don't get to talk to her nearly as often as I would like to. Because again, I think if you were to sit us both down, we probably would disagree for our own like personal opinions. We would probably disagree on 80% of our gadget opinions. And I think every time that we've walked away from that, we've had a blast. Like we ended that podcast and just started cackling. Like it was funny just how much we were kind of back and forth and what about this and what about that. So she's, she, she puts on a fun show. Um, and, and I'm not just saying for like my own appearance, I'm just saying she's uh, a, a tech commentator that you should be subscribed to for putting together a crazy kind of podcast. Um, let me get this out of the way here. <laughs> uh, McCorcor in three, you sort of dunked on her with the education gap comment. I you know, like I I think I made some salient points. I again. It's not a winner loser. I'm not saying like oh, I walked away, you know, you know, schooling uh, Tank Girl. No, it, it's definitely some some back and forth. But again, when you're thinking on the spot and you're trying to to sort of follow the thread of what an argument might be, like I think I did pretty good. <laughs> Um, Dave Burns, she seems really cool. I, I've always had the the utmost respect, and I kind of fanboyed out the very first time I got to speak to her. It was after a, um, a presentation she did on smartwatches, the Pebble, because she used to do some some dev work for Pebble. And when she started talking about 
mobility, wearing computing, you know, like putting a computer on your wrist, like I was all in. When it comes to smartwatches, she and I are definitely in lockstep. When it comes to fashion phones versus premium mid-rangers versus, you know, uh, high-end flagship devices, there, there's there's some disconnect. And that's where I think the fun happens. And lastly, uh, like I said, last week was pretty busy. Lastly, I was really happy to put this video together from Newegg. It could definitely use a little bit more love and some more shares. But I'm, I'm a passionate mobile gamer. I love to play games on mobile devices. And uh, we put this together with Newegg, saving mobile gaming, the big problems with mobile gaming and how to fix them. And it's our top three. I really wanted Newegg to put top three in the title. In fact, I might even go back and ask them to retitle this video. But uh, I, my, my assertion is it's not the games. The games aren't the problem with mobile gaming. There are good games to play. Game discovery, app monetization, social features, communication features, all of the other stuff about mobile gaming is proper broken. And that comes directly from the companies that manage app stores, Apple and Google, which we're going to be talking about a little bit later in this podcast. Apple looking at some antitrust and some investigations, and we're probably overdue. So folks, every story we're going to be talking about this week, including all of the housekeeping we just went through, is going to be on the show notes, somegadgetguy.com and 917. We did it. I did housekeeping in nine minutes. <laughs> I love it. Ah, I love it. Matt Tyler, this video needs more traction. Wait till the Reddit plug. <laughs> Otako, two times. Yeah, I agree. Google Play Store is disturbingly full of trash. Um, <laughs> Mike, it happened. I loves me some good antitrust. I think we should all be a little bit more uh, 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 on the antitrust investigation bandwagon. And McCorkin, three shots of espresso all around. I got like six hours of sleep last night. I'm going to be a maniac. This is going to be great. Okay. Uh, we've got a really full news block and we've got a pretty full gadget block. So I, I think we should jump right in. Um, we've got, uh, let me get this out of the way here. Um one of the other major life stories, uh, again, it sort of transcends all uh, sort of topics, um, was the sudden and somewhat shocking passing of Chadwick Boseman. Um, I, I would put up a, a like a stream of the Marvel uh, memorial video that they put together which they showed uh, on Sunday, where they replayed Black Panther on network TV without any commercial interruptions. Um, I I'd show you that, but if I replay any of that video, I'm definitely going to be getting copyright strikes out the wazoo. Um, it's uh, it, it was a sad, and I, I use the word shocking just for how private uh, Mr. Bozeman kept his struggles in fighting cancer. And I'm sure a number of us in our in this live chat have experienced some kind of loss uh, through disease, through sudden events, through natural causes. I mean, we, we can all sort of appreciate uh, the fragility of life. But to see him take up the mantle of this comic book character in a series of, you know, super high budget Marvel films and to really live that life off screen, you know, uh, visiting cancer wards and, and being an advocate for, for health and for, for children and to be a role model and to kind of live up to that aspirational idea of Black Panther was already commendable. You know, going back and seeing the tweet from President Obama about his, his meeting with Chadwick Boseman is, is, a, is a bittersweet but heartwarming testimony to a life well lived. That was already impressive enough. But then to learn that he was doing that while trying to fight cancer is a remarkable testament to the quality of his character and the fortitude of his spirit. And it's it, it's insufficient. The, the tech tie-in for my tech commentary podcast 
Um, the final tweet from Chadwick Boseman's Twitter account is now the most like tweet ever. So it's broken the record for the most number of likes. Um, it, it, it's not really from him. It's, uh, it's the final tweet just announcing that he had passed. So I'm sure we, we can all here agree. This was a life well lived. Uh, this was a life that ended too soon. And, uh, you know, all of our thoughts and considerations and fond memories and well wishes to his family and friends. So that's, uh, that's really all I have to say about that. <laughs> McCorican three rest in power. I, I feel like, I feel like that's, that's good. I like rest in power. Some of the artwork coming out from, from fans, especially some of the black, uh, the, the black Panther, uh, iconography and imagery coming out. It, you know, it's it's overly simplistic. So, oh, he's going to be remembered for Black Panther. You know, like... It's, again, words are insufficient, and I feel like our, our, our feelings on this are probably more reflective of, of the impact that he made on film community. So uh, we're, we're going we're gonna to go from there. Matt Tyler, the only hero we needed was his own fight to be the hero for us in real life. Man, nicely said, Matt. Nicely said. Uh, moving on to just some sillier news, uh, or you know, some more frivolous news. I shouldn't say silly. More frivolous news. <laughs> uh, Netflix. Netflix is going to make some movies and shows free worldwide to non-subscribers. If you're if you're one of the people who does not currently have a Netflix account. There's a handful of movies and TV shows, but there is a little bit of a catch. Uh, the TV shows, things like Stranger Things, only the first episode, I think first or first two episodes. Oh, only the first episodes of the shows are available for free viewing, but the movies are going to be full length. And so this is a new sort of marketing strategy from Netflix. You know, there's a ton of competition coming from uh, different streaming services and different multimedia solutions. And so Netflix is going to start including ads on the content that they have under their catalog. So if you're not a subscriber to Netflix and you don't mind a 30 second pre-roll, you can jump in and watch some of this stuff while they're feeling generous. Um, then from there, we uh, I, I'm sure Netflix is hoping that you'll you'll pay money to subscribe. <laughs> so uh yes netflix free stuff i i mean i i i haven't hung with when um when this whole shelter in place situation started i was really trying to find like you know here here's something free you can do here's a, a fun freebie that won't won't hit the wallet too hard i haven't kept up with that as much um the the commentary on that didn't seem to get a lot of traction and i was trying to put together videos like here's how you can tap your local library and here are web services that can help you know keep your kids schooling current um so we'll have to see if uh if any of that uh, resonates I, again, I, like our future is so streaming and subscription heavy, having a few things that you can watch for free and, and even having to sit through some ads while you're watching it, I, I feel is going to be a, a strong push or a strong strategy. Um, McCorkin three, I just fixed the dual screen issues. Netflix from my, uh, from my uh, video last week. Uh, it is very frustrating that I have to install. I have to sideload an older version of Netflix so that I can watch Netflix on one screen and not have it paused if I do something on my second screen. So it's pretty it's it's pretty great. Oh, and I did. I missed it. Ah, dang it. I need to find a better way to keep my chat in line. Gary just hit 50 subs gifted. Thank you so much for supporting this stream for this this podcast, my channel, Gary the Fireman. Uh, very deserving of massive thumbs ups and kudos and and again the the support has just been phenomenal and i i appreciate it so much um sorry i missed again i can't keep my twitch chat going popped out on all of this but thank you i i definitely appreciate it 
<laughs> he's amazing. Uh, McCorcoran three. He's amazing. He's the mother Teresa of Twitch. He's, he, he's very good people. Um, I wanted to throw this in here because I think it's little bits of strategizing for the future. Um, this story isn't, isn't, uh, you know, like a, a crazy shift in the way that we talk about tech, but I do think it's, it's a hint. It's a step towards what our futures might be with online data and services. You know, as soon as, you know, Dropbox and box.net and all of these cloud services started popping up, we saw this like rush. Every manufacturer for gadgets was trying to make their own. I mean, I still get notes about my Asus web storage, and I ha I don't think I've logged into it in five or six years. Um, let me get this out of the way here. So it's interesting when we see some companies start to pivot and walk away from some of those online strategies. Here's Samsung. Uh, this is coming by way of ghacks.net, written up by Martin Brinkman. Samsung announced today that it plans to terminate some of its Samsung cloud services. The services Gallery Sync, Drive, and premium storage subscriptions will be deprecated over the course of the coming year. The features are not gone completely, however, as Microsoft's OneDrive service will be used instead. Samsung is offering customers migration options to get their data from Gallery Sync and Drive to Microsoft's OneDrive service. Alternatively, it is possible to download the data to mobile devices or desktop computer systems. So we've seen a really strong partnership between Samsung and Microsoft. I mean, for example, Microsoft, uh, your phone, uh, not my phone, but your phone, um, <laughs> the app on Windows, it functions better currently on Samsung devices. So we can see that those two companies really are sort of leveraging each other's strengths. And, and there's something that makes a lot of sense here. If you're Samsung, why reinvent the wheel and produce and manage the servers and try and keep up with the data security policies for something that's easily replicated? You know, it, it, that, it doesn't seem to provide that significant of a benefit for Galaxy owners, especially when a lot of them are probably also using some form of G Drive, so maybe some kind of work cloud solution. Um, I'm a big fan of OneDrive. I mean, again, if I were on Samsung, I, I don't know that this would bother me because I'm already using OneDrive for a lot of this stuff anyway. Dave Burns, but what about the ecosystem? And I think that's what's kind of interesting is looking at Samsung and looking at how much it costs to operate this stuff, if it's not providing that tangible of a benefit to your customers, why not offload it? A strategic partnership with Microsoft, as Microsoft is getting ready to put out some hardware, seems to make a bit more sense that the two companies wouldn't be trying to step on each other's toes as much as they're trying to work together. DT Anil, cloud services never appealed to me. I always try to keep a physical copy of my data. I well, I agree that we shouldn't we shouldn't leverage the cloud as like our sole backup. But I mean, I've made this joke before. I mean, it's not really a joke. I've detailed my paranoid um, strategy before, but I, I I keep our most important content, our most important photos and documents quadruple backed up between a desktop, a hard drive, my NAS, and cloud services, um, that's that's my gig. So, I mean, if you use the cloud or cloud services as some kind of secondary backup, it's always good to have redundancy. I, I definitely very much enjoy redundancy. <laughs> Dave Burns, too. It's that XKCD comic, isn't it? <laughs> So, so many of my life experiences have been detailed in XKCD comics. <laughs> um, <laughs> Matt Tyler, Juan is winning this gift sub war, Gary, and he deserves it. Aw, you guys are super sweet. I appreciate that. Uh, here's another quick story. Again, it's a, it's a new story that broke. It's not earth shaking, but it is maybe an early trend that we should keep our eye on. Um, I I don't really use Spotify for podcasts. Well, I'm going to get a sip of water here. <laughs> um, I don't use Spotify for podcasts. My, my 
podcast is available on Spotify if that's how you choose to organize your uh, your podcasting activities. But after we saw Joe Rogan get such a huge deal um, from Spotify, uh, again, rumors putting it at like it could have been a hundred million dollar deal, which uh, in my opinion probably means that Joe Rogan's podcast was worth more than a hundred million dollars. Uh, hearing some of the reactions from podcasters who were on the platform before him has been kind of interesting. And so here we've got a music show that has been very vocal about how they won't be going back to Spotify after their contract is up. Joe Budden's podcast will no longer be a Spotify exclusive coming from Chris Holt on endgadget.com. Spotify is set to lose one of its most popular exclusive podcasts next month. Joe Budden is splitting from the service, which has been home to his hip-hop-focused show for the last two years when his contract expires. The company made an offer to keep the Joe Budden podcast with Rory and Mal on its platform, but Budden told his listeners it was, quote, a bum-ass deal, unquote. He said that he didn't know yet where they'd be able to listen to the show as of September 23rd, but, quote, as it stands, I can tell you where it will not be, and that is Spotify. And so this this article is, is very abbreviated, but it goes on to kind of detail that Budden felt like Spotify was actively pitting creators against each other and acted as a disruptive force between him and his uh, community, which is exactly the concern I had when we heard the news from Joe Rogan. Joe Rogan, the popularity of Joe, the Joe Rogan experience of his podcast was how organic it grew in a direct relationship um, with interview uh, with Joe Rogan as an interviewer, the people he had on his show to interview, and then the people that consumed his show directly. I don't understand a hundred million dollar deal from Joe Rogan's perspective, where Spotify then acts as a middleman in between him and his audience. And I feel any kind of direct monetization probably would have benefited Joe more over the long run. I can't blame him for taking a huge payday up front. You know, based on whether or not you feel like the, the the property is worth that much or that you can monetize to that to that degree. Someone put a big plate of money under his nose. I, I don't fault him for taking the deal. I just feel like in the in the long term, having any proprietary or exclusivity on something as open as a podcast to me uh, will be bad. Any growth that Joe Rogan has from here on out is going to be locked up with Spotify. And if he ever decides to leave Spotify, a huge chunk of that audience is 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 following him because of Spotify. And again, it would be like if he decided to take his show to XM Radio, right? You know, like I got all this money, but now my viewership is radically reduced because of the number of people who would download a podcast versus the number of people on this platform, this exclusive platform, which also makes him less financially viable. You know, if Joe Rogan's numbers are cut in half. Those are still amazing numbers, but that also reduces his potential to charge for things like ad placement and sponsorships. And all of that now goes through money-making, advertising, and monetization trends for Spotify. Again, it's it's strange stuff. So if Joe Budden, a, a very popular show that I know I've started going back and you can catch like his shows on YouTube. <laughs> like I should have been listening to the show for a while now. It's a really good show. Um if, if that's like the first of a trend, you know, people stepping away from Spotify, Spotify as an exclusive platform is something we should keep an eye on. I really hope any proprietary or exclusive podcasting service, I kind of hope it crashes and burns. I want an RSS feed that I can put into my own podcast hosting app and that I can control how I listen to my podcasts. I do not want four or five different apps on my phone that all kind of achieve the same storage podcast bucket on my phone, but that the the differences are, well, this podcast, I have to open up this app. And this podcast, I have to open up that app. I have a podcast app. I like Podcast Republic. I want to open up that app and look at all of my subscriptions and be able to listen to whatever I want. So, um... I, and from McCorcoran, McCorcoran or M. Corcoran, I'm not entirely sure. 
Um, <laughs> Corcoran 3, they bought Ringer, and now they're planning major layoffs. And that's always going to be the way of things. You, you eat up another service, and then you start hacking away at what you don't need any anymore. Mike, it happened. I use app, uh, I use Spotify and Apple Podcasts. I hope the trend isn't moving toward exclusivity because it's annoying having to remember where each podcast is streamed on. Completely accurate, Mike. Completely accurate. Kyle Ruggles is fronting for Pocket Casts. Dave Burns, Pocket Casts is the one true podcast app. I know I am not picking the most popular, but if you've followed any of my videos or commentary in the past, you know that I enjoy competition. And so I will be sticking with Podcast Republic, especially after these most recent updates, which really helped clean up the UI. And I loves it. I loves my my little side hustle Podcast Republic podcast. <laughs> uh, McCorcoran 3. Just call me Mike. Excellent. And Jim, 70, 72165 Podcast Addict. <laughs> Saeed pocket cast for president okay i mean i have to admit pocket casts probably be doing a better job of presidenting than what we are currently okay so um (laughs) excuse me uh this is the part of the show where we dig into apple uh i am definitely keeping this on the roster of topics for a while uh, the, the entire Apple app store Epic fight, it's kind of like alien versus predator, right? You know, I don't, I don't really have a horse in this race. It's not like I'm predisposed to liking Apple's business practices, especially as it pertains to, um, anti-consumer behavior, uh, fighting right to repair legislation and, uh, trying to wall up their garden from any kind of outside competition. And at the same time, it's not like I'm a big fan of Epic. I don't play Fortnite. Um, I like that I get free games from Epic Game Store. That's kind of neat, but I'm not rooting for them. It's not like I feel like they're so right and Apple is so wrong. But what's fascinating is however this plays out is going to reset, is going to set the stage for the future of commerce, how we do business with companies like Apple and Google and Microsoft as consumers on the ground. And that's what's interesting is we're starting to see our legal system try to adapt to 21st century uh, business practices. We're, we're, we're way out of date. The way that we regulate this space is sort of dependent on a model that's more brick and mortar. And our politicians, our lawmakers, our judges are now just starting to get on board what a 21st century digital economy really looks like. So uh, the the big news for Apple versus Epic, Apple just terminated Epic's App Store dev account, but the war has just begun. This is written up by Nathan Ord over on Hot Hardware. If Apple went nuclear several days back, they have now gone thermonuclear by terminating a developer account owned by Apple by Epic Games. Apple claims it is not included in the legal ruling amid the court battle, but this just kicks things up a notch. So I, I had to throw in the hot hardware article because how over the top? I mean, the legal wrangling on this has just begun. And hot hardware has now elevated this from nuclear to thermonuclear. So I need everyone in the comments over under when this gets even hotter and we start getting legal summations and verdicts from courts, where does hot hardware go after thermonuclear? Whoa. Eh? Eh? I don't know what comes after thermonuclear. Someone, someone dropped me a comment. Your favorite, your favorite, my favorite. We'll, we'll get a special shout out from my heart. <laughs> Raymond, it sun hot. <laughs> Dave Burns, heat death. <laughs> Nom, black hole. <laughs> so hot hardware. Once you get past the the ridiculous over the topness of the intro. Um, there is a pretty good sort of back and forth um, here. This is the, uh, they, they include the statement from Apple. We are disappointed that we have to turn, we, let me try that again. 
We are disappointed that we have had to terminate the Epic Games account on the App Store. We have worked with the Epic team for many years on their launches and releases. The court recommended that Epic comply with the App Store guidelines while their case moves forward. Guidelines they followed for the past decade until they created the situation. Epic has refused. Instead, they repeatedly submit Fortnite updates designed to violate the guidelines of the App Store. This is not fair to all other developers on the App Store and is putting customers in the middle of their fight. We hope that we can work together again in the future, but unfortunately, that is not possible today. Now, Tim Sweeney at Epic replied to this directly. Apple's statement isn't forthright. They chose to terminate Epic's account. They didn't have to. Apple suggests we spammed the App Store review process. That's not so. Epic submitted three Fortnite builds, two bug fix updates, and the Season 4 update with this note. And he goes on to detail the sort of additional information they, they supplied to Apple for the Fortnite Season 4 update. So again, Apple PR and Epic PR are both waging this hearts and mind campaign. It's, uh, it's kind of a hilarious back and forth. We're, we're not seeing... We, we can't be privy to all of the behind the scenes details on how this stuff goes down. So Apple can say like, oh, well, we've had these rules in place. I guess we have to cancel their account. But pulling this one app doesn't mean that they had to, that they it was mandatory that they nuke Epic's developer account. Removing the app from the app store seems like that's the policy when something is in the app that violates their terms of service so again from the outside it does look like an additional punitive action on apple's part which is sort of flying in the face of tim cook's testimony to that judiciary committee uh, if anyone ever speaks out about apple do you guys take you know additional punitive actions and tim cook no, we do not bully that is not in our company's makeup we we are we are not trying to to, to, to fight people. It's, it's uh, you know, we, we take a measured approach. So here's the problem. Something like this happens, Epic is not particularly sympathetic, right? That's part of the problem. Epic is a big, loud voice, but how many other smaller developers have been affected by this and haven't been able to speak out because they don't have the resources to speak out against Apple. <laughs> you know, again, a company that's hitting like a $2 trillion market cap and just split their stock again, who, who fights that? If you want access to one of the, the more robust platforms for monetizing software development, you just have to eat it. You have to do whatever Apple says, even though Apple can also compete with your software and services. So if you have a really great app idea that improves the functionality of an iPhone, if it's really good and it gets popular, there's a very good chance that Apple can take your IP or similar IP, even if it's not exactly the same, and incorporate it into iOS. That is the competition. It's very much like Amazon in that respect. Come up with a great business strategy. Amazon gets a ton of data on how your customers work, and then they can offer a competing solution. They get all the behind the scenes. You don't get anything. So if we're going to talk about Apple versus not sympathetic competitors, <laughs> we should also clarify um, a story that I talked about a couple weeks back, Apple versus Facebook. So when this went down, I, I misunderstood what the problem was. Facebook put out a version of the Facebook app, and I thought it was how like games are monetized on Facebook's platform. I was incorrect. Apple pulled a version of the Facebook app that did not offer alternative methods of monetization. I thought the problem was Facebook included a way to, you know, like you're, I don't even know what you do on Facebook anymore. I honestly have not logged in for any significant length of time to Facebook in years. Um, you know, I'm taking this back to like my old man memories of people playing Farmville, but I thought it was, you have a game on Facebook, there's a monetization option and Facebook included some way of paying directly. That's not what the problem was. So this is all boiling down. 
Uh, Saeed is, is mentioning this on, on a, um, Periscope. Apple forced Facebook to remove details about the 30% cut they take when giving info to small businesses. So let me go into CNBC, and then I'm going to show you Facebook's actual um, response here. Apple pulled a Facebook app because of disclosure. So Facebook is, is trying to implement this uh, strategy um, where they are enabling certain business pages to charge for direct content. And it's a little Patreon-y, right? So, but let's say you've got a, a cooking workshop. This is one of the examples they give, Jasper's cooking class, and you can pay $9.99 to join Jasper's cooking class. Facebook is trying this initiative where they are not taking any money. This is a direct transaction facilitated by Facebook so that that $9.99 would go directly to Jasper. If you use the Facebook app on iOS, well, that's another in-app purchase. So Jasper, anyone who, who pays $9.99 to Jasper, Jasper is going to lose three bucks. Apple's going to take 30%. So what Facebook did is they put out a version of the app where they detailed Apple takes 30% of this purchase, learn more. Well, Facebook, I mean, Apple did not like that Facebook told the consumers on Facebook that Apple was taking a 30% cut of these direct transactions. So now, uh, so Apple pulled this app. Again, it doesn't violate the term of service. It, it only details the financial transaction. I feel consumers would want to know, I gave 10 bucks to Jasper and Jasper only got seven. Oh, that greedy Facebook. They're taking all this money from, from poor, struggling, small business owners on Facebook. So Facebook tried to properly detail what goes down in the financial transaction and Apple pulled their app for that, that disclosure. We need a modern 21st century regulatory agency. The spirit of consumer protections I feel is violated when an app marketplace can dictate to an app developer, you are not allowed to tell your customers how their money is being distributed. There's probably no legal precedent for this in any kind of direct fashion or direct um, uh, regulatory uh, precedent. So now we need to examine this kind of behavior. Facebook should be allowed to tell people on their platform what cut Apple is taking of the financial tra transactions that they engage in. That to me is indefensible, <laughs> but we, now we need to set a legal precedent for, um, for why, you know, again, there, there needs to be law that points to, or a judgment or a verdict that points to some kind of baseline for what is appropriate and what is acceptable disclosure. If I take a sponsorship, I've got to tell you where that money came, I, that I'm taking money to produce a piece of content. Um, FTC would be up my rear if I started playing fast and loose with those kinds of guidelines. And, you know, it's not crazy, you know, uh, in-depth disclosure on every single link, but almost every single piece of media I put out there, I talk about how there are affiliate links because that's one of the main ways that I try to monetize this content as opposed to baking ads and sponsorships into everything that I make. This is a bad look for Apple. <laughs> this is real hard to defend. So the, the, <clears throat> the current strategy, the current solution is instead of saying Apple takes 30% of this purchase, uh, the, the acceptable uh, version of the Facebook app now says Facebook doesn't take a fee from this purchase, learn more. And then that takes you off to another website where you get a little bit more detail on what's going on with purchases. But even that, you know, like it doesn't feel sufficient. You know, if someone said like, oh, well, I gave Jasper 10 bucks and then Jasper only got seven. Man, what's going on, Facebook? The point of service and the point of monetization happened through Facebook. So it's still on Facebook to try and expl explain 
what the heck is going on and how many people are just going to get frustrated versus actually digging deeper to look at what happened with that. They're not going to be upset with Apple because they're not, Apple is allowed to prevent that kind of commentary from happening on their platform. Hey, and Fat Produce, Andrew Wallace is in the live chat. Um, so again, we get to the end of this and it's a pretty meaty, um, I, I mean, again, I had to correct myself because I thought this was a different situation than what really went down. Um, I, I wasn't particularly sympathetic to, to Facebook because you shouldn't be sympathetic to Facebook. I, I'm not looking to Facebook to be some virtuous defender of online business, quite the opposite. But I had to correct myself here because this situation read very differently when I thought this was like Facebook app developers and Facebook gamers, not, oh, this, I mean, this is Facebook actually, one part of Facebook actually trying to do something kind of cool, facilitating a monetary transaction with no fees. It locks people into their service. It's definitely something we should examine in terms of how fair <laughs> monetary transactions should be. But it could be a benefit. It could be a help to a small business owner looking to try and monetize some kind of content. That makes Apple look even worse <laughs> in, in this showdown. Again, it's not a good look when you're fighting any trust through uh, a House Judiciary Committee, when you're sparring with Epic, when other app developers have started speaking up about some of the issues on their platform, when you gut a bunch of con uh, contracts with developers for Apple Arcade, and then you're literally taking a huge chunk of money out of people trying to make stuff on Facebook. So reform. We're overdue some reform. <laughs> ER 1980, you shouldn't be sympathetic to Facebook. You shouldn't. No, Facebook is not a sympathetic entity. It's not like I'm, I'm picking them to be the winner here. It's, again, I, I want to point this out. Epic and Facebook, they're humongous software entities. They're humongous developers. We're talking super well-funded uh machines that can amplify signal that can amplify a story can make a message bigger how many smaller developers have run into issues on these platforms and then what is the relationship or what is the responsibility of apple with an app store you're telling me i can't engage in a direct financial relationship with a producer on facebook through the ios facebook app does Apple take 30% of every transaction on Amazon? Why would buying something on Amazon, a direct financial relationship between me and a seller on Amazon, be any different than me contributing directly to Jasper's cooking class? And legally, you're now going to have to set a precedent for why those two separate transactions are different and should be handled differently and not just say, well, Amazon's real big and we don't want to fight Amazon. So we're going to give them preferential treatment because Tim Cook said no one gets preferential treatment on the app store. And then he was asked, but don't some people pay a different commission? And then Tim Cook said, yes. <laughs> so some people pay a different commission. Some animals are more equal than other animals because you have a completely walled off garden here. <laughs> and dave burns picking on wordpress that was a bad look and wordpress not as big as facebook for getting that message out there I, again it's um it's it's a bad look <laughs> dave burns it's like beating up the nerd because you can <laughs> Oh, Matt Tyler, and don't forget Microsoft's includings in this battle too, because uh, Apple doesn't want you to be able to stream games uh, on iOS devices. And so no game streaming. Uh, you want Apple Arcade where they're not going to invest in good quality games. They just want more Candy Crush clones. And, and Nam, yeah, I thought that was hilarious too. Nam says Apple is promoting PUBG very heartily, but game is on Unreal Engine. Um, let me see if I can get back to... Oh, I don't know if it was in this this article. Let's see. 
No, there's another tweet from um, Tim Sweeney who comments on that also. Uh, Tim Sweeney at Epic also saying like, hey, how funny is it that after they kicked Fortnite off of our off their platform, they started heavily promoting PUBG, which is also built on the Unreal Engine. So the developer account that got nuked was just the account that manages Fortnite. It doesn't seem that other developers that use Unreal Engine are going to be caught in the crossfire yet. But this lawsuit is going to determine whether or not Epic will be allowed to update Unreal Engine for iOS. If this falls in that direction, then any app that uses Unreal Engine is going to is basically effectively killed on iOS. And um, <laughs> from Mike, lobbying power is real. <laughs> All right. Uh, one last, uh, the, the, the big news story, I, I watched through this whole live stream. It was crazy. It was a little bit ghastly. Closing out the news block this week. Um, who is ready to let Elon Musk drill away uh, about a smartwatch sized chunk of your skull and implant a Fitbit style computing system with wires that interact directly with the neurons of your brain. Anyone? Hold up your hands. Is anyone ready to let Elon Musk just bore a hole on, under, your, under your skin? I mean, like, it's subdermal. It's not like it's going to stick out. Um, Dave Burns says, no. Punch Coon says, I am. Matt Tyler says, yes, of course. Nam says, not me. <laughs> Kyle Ruggle says, nope. Uh, Neuralink. We got our first sort of proper look at the state of Neuralink. Uh, Zenny Jardine at Boing Boing has this write up. Again, I would play some of the live stream if I thought I wouldn't get wrecked for copyright. This was a fascinating examination of where we might go for better biological interfacing with technology. Um, we're all talking about these like cyborg pigs, these bionic pigs. Um, but he, he, Elon Musk made a point out of showing, you know, here's a pig that has a Neuralink currently installed and this is what it can do. And then here's a pig that had the Neuralink removed and look, it looks like it's just a normal happy pig. Um, this is, we're going to get there at some point. I, I feel like during this live stream, one of the things that really struck me was we don't really get the detail on what the product testing for something like this might resemble. And so getting some of this disclosure automatically just feels ghastly. Like, hey, we're experimenting on pigs. Here's a pig. We drilled a hole in its head. When 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 I simplify... That presentation, when I that reductive with that presentation, it leaves me feeling a bit queasy. You know, like I was watching this live stream, kind of like gassed. You know, like hand in my face, uh, in my face in my hand. Like, oh my gosh, I didn't realize like crazy mad scientist Elon Musk is already drilling holes in mammals' heads. And then he showed what the uh, the system is going to look like. It's a an outpatient procedure. Um, a very small chunk of your skull is removed. This thing is inserted. These robots then manipulate these tiny, these these super super fine fiber wires into your into your brain to start detailing this information. You don't even need anesthesia. It's it's such a simple procedure and it's completely reversible. A little bit ghastly. I mean, I can't lie. I, I've been making this joke for a while that I'm ready to be a cyborg. You know, I want neural interfaces. I want to plug in. I want to jack in. I want to, like, have computing power and technology sort of immediately brain accessible. I'm ready. Sign me up. The reality of being confronted with what that looks like today, I'm not going to be a Gen 1. <laughs> I'm not going to be that guy trying to test this out at the very beginning of our... Uh, of our um, experiences with neural implants, but it is 
an interesting step towards where we might go. A major component of this Neuralink presentation is now on trying to repair damage. Someone who suffered an injury, someone who uh, is experiencing hearing loss, being able to interface directly with the brain could hopefully stave off some of the uh, debilitating aspects of certain body, brain, and neurological uh, damage. Um, it has the potential to be a positive force for a number of degenerative diseases. It, it has the potential from there to grow into a way that we can augment our senses and, and link more directly with not only computing platforms, but each other. You know, getting a sense of someone's emotional state because you two are buddies on the same friends list and you've given each other access to your neural links, kind of in the same way that you might track each other's fitness on a Fitbit. There, there is so much wonderful, so much amazing, so much magical science fiction being packed into these types of uh, product demos that I, I'm, I'm passionately, I'm aggressively interested in, in where we might go with this. But being confronted with the reality of it did, did give me some pause. It, it took me a step back. Like, at what point are we talking about the, the safety of subdermal implants? And how do we make a consumer-facing device that doesn't trigger aggressive responses from your immune system? And what do we do if something goes sizzle pop? <laughs> this is a battery-operated device that charges with inductive charging on the side of your head. Um, what's the liability? You can't sign away the liability. I mean, there, there is no legal document in existence that is strong enough to sign away, you know, uh, you know, someone, someone fried my brain with a Neuralink. Oh, I signed an NDA. I guess I can't, I guess I can't sue them. <laughs> I'll, I'll go into binding arbitration. Um, <clears throat> it's, it's, it opens the door to so many questions at, at, I mean, pardon the pun, but at the bleeding edge of lifestyle, consumer electronics, material science, um, brain and um, bio, biology uh, research. Every, every, again, I, I was in my Discord um, having a conversation with a couple of people in the Discord, uh, Zenith and, and Aditya Anil and a couple other guys. And every single time they would de uh, uh, detail some other part of their their platform or their development process or the software or the hardware it just it just highlighted like how much i don't know about durable medical equipment <laughs> like well we put this thing in your skull and you're like immediately like well how does how do you do that where the body isn't trying to attack it you know what what is the immune system response of something being bored into your brain how does that work but again, it's like we don't really get granular answers to those types of questions. It, it was, it, it it was kind of a trying um, stream to uh, to interact with. I'm from Saeed. I'm scared this will be the thing to replace lie detectors. I absolutely, I, again, for your personhood. As soon as you have some sort of technologically accessible pathway, wh how, when does our legal system start protecting? I mean, we already have sort of some general guidelines, like police cannot compel you to give up uh, a password for your phone. So if you're emitting a Bluetooth signal that connects to your phone, what protections and security should you expect if someone wants to read the data? I mean, you know, again, so many questions that get opened up that we are unprepared as a society to completely uh, to completely answer. But at the same time, it's like someone had to be first. Someone someone needs to start going here. Uh, the future of mobile consumer electronics is kind of plateaued, and I would say we've been ready for the last three or four years to start seeing what might come next. If it's augmented reality and smart glasses or better audio tools and the ability to uh, to track uh, more content through visual or audio uh, sources, great. But every single step we've made has been finding a way to make this interaction more organic. 
So, you know, like holding up a phone is, is organic, is more organic than sitting in front of a computer. Now I've moved so much of my communication and, and interactions to something a little bit more uh, discreet. This is not super organic. So let's take notifications and health tracking and move it to our wrist. That's a little bit more organic. I absolutely love my focals because it took something off my wrist and put it up at eye level. But making that more organic made it more difficult to manufacture. It had to be more customized. It had to be fitted for me. Every small step that we make makes this even more invasive. It makes it more personal, makes it more uh, focused for that one consumer, which makes it more expensive too. But now we're getting to the very, very first steps, the baby steps of uh, how do we plug something into our brain? Uh, thankfully, where, what it looks like right now, I mean, Elon Musk made a joke about this being a Fitbit for your brain. The data that we're trafficking right now is pretty limited. <laughs> they showed us on the pig how it was connecting with neurons in the brain that really tracked um, uh, interactions with its snout. It's a very sensitive organ, smell, touch, you know, uh, how it navigates, how it how it determines um, what's food, what's not food. You know, a pig's nose is very precious to a pig. And so they showed us these graphs. Um, which, I, again, I wish I could show you in this live stream, but you can watch this uh, this presentation yourself, too, and I would highly recommend it if you've got a strong enough stomach to handle it. Um, seeing the real-time neurological activity firing up with the parts of the brain that connect directly to the pig's snout. That's fascinating. That's exactly the first steps where we need to go. The long-term is being able to intercept enough information that we could maybe potentially start storing memories in decent fidelity, uh, being able to start interpreting data, being able to start communicating through this type of neurological activity, and then also being able to write information to the brain. So Elon Musk very casually like, yeah, and we're planning on doing this so that you know we can write information. And other people that were sitting there representing Neuralink we're all a little bit more measured in their reactions to that. Uh, but again, if we're talking about electrical impulses and being able to understand the brain better, at some point we get to a, a we, we get to a place where we can map and read this information in a meaningful way and and interact with it with other senses that were designed for these specific neurological impulses. It's it's fascinating. I want this so bad. I do not want to be one of Elon Musk's pigs. <laughs> From Mike, I would like a nonprofit public entity to do this, not an eccentric billionaire. <laughs> Simon says, Hypno, but does the Neuralink feel good in the head? I mean, does it feel good in the, I mean, it feels really not, it feels like it's a premium product uh, drilled directly into my brain. It feels pretty good in the head. <laughs> So yeah, crazy, crazy madcap future. Again, all the potential in this one press conference for uh, uh, the, the, the utopian hopes of a Star Trek style society and the dystopian fears of basically every other piece of modern science fiction. Um, I, I mean, I look at, I, I look at a book like Arthur C. Clarke's 3001 A Space Odyssey and their depiction of brain-based computing platforms. And it's it's kind of quaint. <laughs> like, you know, what one of the characters, you know, describes getting his head shaved and basically wearing a bowl on his head that sort of interacts with parts of his brain. Um Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that was supposed to happen in the year 3001. And here we are in 2020 with something that's even a bit more um, invasively organic than what Arthur C. Clarke thought would be acceptable. So, yeah. Um, <laughs> Simon says, Hypno, quote, I'm sorry, your thought has violated our terms of service and will be blocked and removed. One more strike will revoke your thought privileges. <laughs> it's funny because it's gross. Um all right, let's get into the uh, subreddit plug so we can move on to the gadget block. Every podcast has a subreddit. Mine is not focused on me, even when I win. 
Uh, Reddit.com slash r slash glowing rectangles is an initiative that I'm trying to put more energy behind where we can try and uh, boost uh, content for people we think deserve more attention. The entire focus of this subreddit is to try and 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 uh, give a bit more attention to people we feel deserve the views. If it's a writer, if it's a, a video producer, vlogger, uh, some loosely tech adjacent in some way, Glowing Rectangles is a place. I hope you will consider sharing more content, upvoting more content, and throwing around some more uh, comments and uh, interactions. So these were the top stories on our glowing rectangles. Let me get this out of the way right here. Top story of the week, Note 20 Ultra, first impressions as a former Note 9 user. So this is posted by user Mott427, wrote up his experiences or wrote up their experiences. I'm not sure if Mott is a man or a woman. Um, wrote up their experiences, moving and upgrading. And this is, to me, this is a very real life uh, depiction of what this upgrade would look like. Someone on a Note 9 might be getting a little itchy to pull the trigger on a newer phone. The Note 20 just came out. And yeah, that, that seems like a more reasonable upgrades path or strategy than how we tech reviewers are constantly playing with a different $1,000 plus phone every other week. Uh, number two. Posted by Maximum Inc. 12, published my Pixel 4a review. This phone is such a delight to use. Truly a phone for anyone from uh, the Matridox. I have a hard time saying that. The Matridox.com. Um, I've really been enjoying playing with my Pixel 4a, and it's nice to get some, uh, some more commentary on a phone that won't break the bank. And then number three, not necessarily a me video, but a video with me in it that I produced for Newegg, the big problems with mobile gaming and how to fix them from Newegg Studios. So I came in third, even though I technically didn't come in third. It wasn't me, it wasn't my channel, but I came in third. So, you know, Matt Tyler and Dave Burns, um, you can eat it. And uh, we're gonna put it out there again they're going to make jokes about downvoting my videos. The whole point of this subreddit, I need to make this clear. This is not a shit posting subreddit. This is, we can use the tools of Reddit to build up the channels we like. So even though I occasionally make it to the top of my own subreddit, this subreddit is not about me. So if you want to help spread the word on other great content, if you want to try and help signal boost for content creators you care about, especially smaller channels, channels trying to reach monetization, upvote. Upvote everything. If something gets popular here, it might be feeder. It might be you know uh, shared to another subreddit. We're starting to see a little cross-posting activity. That's huge for a small community that's been growing every single week since I started it. So like uh, number four, you know, like if we're doing the downvoting thing, you know, the number four was across the podcast with Sam and Matt featuring Super Saf and John Redinger. Now I see a big upvote arrow from where I upvoted uh, Matt's content here. And if you like Super Saf or you like John Redinger, this was a really fun conversation with Sam and Matt and John and Saf. And uh, this deserves more attention. So we would want to push that kind of content up on a subreddit where then search engines are going to scrape it and then across the podcast might be getting some uh some more uh some more activity some more visibility there simon says hypno the last episode with sam and matt with techspert was brilliant so again we want to encourage as much up boating as possible uh, even for Matt and Dave making jokes about downvoting my content. We've got uh, Note 20 Ultra versus S20 Ultra from TK Mabe. We've got Poco F2 Pro full review. We've got Ben, lover of tech, checking out the return of BlackBerry in 2021. My buddy, bored at work, and a bong looking at a $200 gaming phone. And again, our, our one of our favorite curmudgeons, Luis Rossman, Epic versus Apple, the big debate. All of this stuff, really, really quality, and it helps kind of pad out the broader tech discussion. If you go to YouTube, you're going to see kind of an echo chamber around trending topics, the most popular stories, the biggest channels. 
YouTube is like Facebook now. They want to keep you on their platform for as long as possible with the big popular stuff. But the broader tech conversation is just that. It's a wider world. There are other things to talk about. And there are other things that we need to follow up on. Where just because a phone came out you know, and it got all the big traffic its opening week, well, what was it like to use that phone for more than three days during the embargo? Shouldn't we be following up on these devices with an eye towards real world use and lifestyle availability? Reddit.com slash r slash glowing rectangles, my initiative to try and help bridge that conversation. And if you go there, if you've never been before, I guarantee you, you're going to start finding content creators you've never heard before, you've never seen from before, and that you're really going to like the stuff that they make. Even when I win and I'm at the top of my subreddit for a week, it's not a subreddit about me. <laughs> Matt Tyler, you should feel attacked because you're talking about downvoting content in my subreddit, and that's not what my subreddit is all about. Um <laughs> And, and from Mike, Rossman has been discussing ballot initiatives for, for right to repair. <laughs> Matt Tyler, do not downvote. Tech Love and Mama laughing at our exchange. Um, so, uh, yes, reddit.com slash r slash glowing rectangles. This is, this is what, again, content creators need all the help they can get. This was my attempt at trying to help provide a platform for that. And it's been growing. So I can't thank people enough for who are already participating, but we can always use more. More upvotes, more comments, and more sharing through the platform to try and help grow something that people can really use to find new audience, build their own communities, and broaden this tech discussion so that it's not in the hands of a handful of lopsidedly large channels. Because then our tech discussion gets boring, and we don't want that. So... Moving right along. Let me get this out of the way here. <laughs> ah. Aw, Tech Love and Mama. And I appreciate you for creating it. Tech Love and Mama, I appreciate you for participating. <laughs> and Muppinish, uh, in all caps, tech is never boring. Um, this is absolutely accurate. It's just a bit frustrating when we have a very limited discussion on, on tech. And this is one of the reasons why I'm a little concerned. Um, you know, one of the big gadget stories kind of out over the last week was something that I think tech commentators, tech influencers, and tech reviewers kind of dropped the ball on. Um, I, I have been pushing back against some of the tech assertions. Um, I've been doing this for a little while. I think probably my most famous example of this is when, you know, Android police reviewed the LG V30 and completely dismissed the headphone jack capabilities. And David Ruddock wrote this, you know, additional piece of their LG V30 review talking about how, well, this is just voodoo and it's just a filter and uh, that's what it is. And he was wrong. He was completely wrong. He, he completely misjudged the capabilities of the product he uh, completely uh, misinformed his audience as to how this feature functioned. And it was a part of his gadget commentary that he's not known for. You know, I, if you don't know about audio, then you can say, well, I'm making a guess that this is what's happening. But you don't write off something when you don't understand how it functions. And uh, I think there are a precious few gadget commentators um, that do a, a, a consistently good job of digging into the nuts and bolts, the granular, I mean, like deep in the weeds, techy, geeky um, stuff as it, as it uh, pertains to consumer electronics and arrive at the appropriate conclusions consistently and fairly. So we recently heard word Galaxy Note 20 is already a somewhat controversial device in international markets because some versions are getting an Exynos and some versions are getting an upgraded Snapdragon 865 Plus and the 865 already outperforms the Exynos and this, this newer one's even a little bit more uh, powerful. And then we started seeing the teardown videos where some regions, some notes are getting different cooling solutions. 
So some of these phones are getting, you know, copper and vapor chambers, and some of these are getting new um, graphite uh, 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 carbon pads uh, to try and dispel heat. So I, I think, again, one of the more visible examples of this would be the teardown that, uh, that Zach produced on Jerry Riggs Everything. But he started dismissing this alternative cooling mechanism without really testing it. So he does this teardown saying that this is inferior to a vapor chamber or to a copper heat pipe or something like that. But someone correct me if I'm wrong, I haven't seen Zach do any real world performance testing. And I feel that's irresponsible of his position and of his platform to dismiss the engineering or the manufacturing of a component in a phone like the Galaxy Note 20 with a hypothesis. He's got to guess that it's not as good. But I haven't seen data to suggest that his hypothesis is correct. And so it creates this sort of outrage cycle, right? I'm no big fan of Samsung. I, I really don't feel they deserve their position as the default Android option for consumers around the world. But I'm also looking at what could be a competing heating or cooling solution for something as powerful as a Note 20. I mean, we're talking about ridiculous compute power in your pocket. And I don't see anything that would suggest that this is an inferior cooling solution on a phone. So who do we turn to? Um, again, this is an editorial. This isn't a conclusive performance-based, you know, uh, granular benchmarking situation. But while Zach makes some really fun videos, he, he, he makes some really fun gadget destruction porn. You know, a lot of it doesn't really seem germane to real world activities. Like what happens when you hold your phone up to a lighter? Okay, cool. It's, it's a fun visual to look at a screen being, you know, temporarily heat damaged. And you get all of that obnoxious ASMR as he's scraping razor blades against components on the frame. But if I'm looking for an actual practical demonstration of how a phone is put together, my first resource is I fix it. None of the sensationalized gadget destruction trying to bend and break products, because eventually if you try to break something, you'll succeed. But more clean, simple, to the point, and with some funny little quips with the history of gadgets that they've broken down and taken apart. So if I'm going to point anyone towards commentary on this Samsung controversy, I'm going to point to iFixit. I think that they do a more reasonable job of consistently talking about the guts of our phones. So uh, ifixit.com, uh, written up by Jeff Suovenen. Uh Sorry, Jeff, I've mispronounced your last name. It's a thing I do on this show. Why Samsung built competing con cooling systems inside the Note 20, parentheses, and why it's probably fine. And so they go through and they talk about some of the history they've had with Samsung products, including... Uh, the company's combustive history with uh, maybe a, a note that shall be unnamed. Uh, they took a look at their own photography for the Galaxy Note 20 teardown. They also mentioned that some of this solution, this, uh, um, this pad that they're using in some Note 20s, this isn't the first time we've seen it. We've also seen similar solutions on things like the, uh, um, the Z Flip. So this isn't without merit. This isn't like Samsung is purposely trying to make one flavor of their phone cheaper or badder. It's just the companies have done a really good job of advertising copper cooling and copper vapor chambers and heat pipes. You know, I, I would say since the Snapdragon 810 days, we've been talking about how do we efficiently get heat out of a phone and there's something really sexy about vapor cooling or liquid cooling in a phone. We had all those headlines. So if there's a competing solution that performs as well, and maybe it's more cost effective or maybe it's just the same price, we, we as gadget aficionados should be looking at data. We should be looking at the evidence. If graphite can move heat out of a phone as efficiently as a copper 
uh, vapor chamber and graphite doesn't contribute to higher component costs, then I kind of don't care. But now, you know, iFixit has weighed in and they've been talking about some of the differences. And really what I'd like to see is someone, someone performance test them in a way that's not just a gimmicky benchmark. Because we all know, I mean, Sam, Samsung got tagged for it. Every manufacturer has had some kind of history with offering more performance to benchmarking apps than, you know, uh, what the consumer, what the, the user of that phone can really accomplish. But right now, it's all pure speculation. We actually don't know if Graphite does a better job than a vapor chamber. But my hypothesis would be that they perform within a fault tolerance of maybe a 5% delta in heavy use situations. And now we would need to get two similar phones with similar components, but with different cooling solutions to try and test so whether or not that's accurate. And, and really with the wide swath of different note variants and different internal components, that's gonna be exceedingly difficult to know that we've, we, we're getting those two competing solutions on the same benchmark. So it's, it's a bad look. And, and again, iFixit, I think, does, does a... iFixit's commentary here, I believe, is correct. I, I want to call out this part of their review. Um, do, 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 do. So when we revealed in our Galaxy Note 20 teardown that two fresh from the factory Note 20 Ultras might have entirely different cooling systems, most takes were more uh-oh than G, neat. Android Authority, Wired UK, and Sam Mobile all noted how hot the phone felt when doing intensive work, uh, network downloads, gaming, or video recording. PC World measured the Note 20 Ultra at 100 degrees Fahrenheit. Combine these findings with our discovery that some ultras mitigate heat by undergirding their main boards with graphite thermal pads, while others use a copper vapor chamber system, and the result has been taken less as intrigue than betrayal. Tom's Guide dubbed it a shocking omission for a $1,300 phone. The Verge says the difference could explain why your phone is running hot. Well, not so fast. It's important to note that of these six publications, none opened up their phone to verify whether the primary cooler is graphite or copper. For our part, we didn't temp our phones or do any stress testing. We dug straight into the hardware. There is, at this point, seemingly no indication of which phones have graphite or copper inside from packaging, serial numbers, specs, or how hot they feel in the hand. And this is something that I've been bringing up since we've started employing alternative cooling. You take a phone that has a, a larger heat pipe, a vapor chamber, some type of liquid or, or a vapor pipe, or maybe even graphite. If the phone feels hot in your hand, that's probably not a bad thing. If the phone has some kind of advanced material to, to pull heat away from sensitive components, and get it out of the phone, the phone feeling hot in your hand could be an example of it working more efficiently and you facing less thermal throttling because the phone is getting that heat out. You're gonna feel the heat if the phone is getting the heat out more, more effectively. And that's, that's what's disappointing is we've got a number of gadget commentators and bloggers and reviewers all playing the same influencer game. Oh, this is different. I heard this was bad. Now I'm going to jump on this bandwagon. And I don't really know what I'm talking about. But I'm coming to this conclusion. Oh, the phone feels hot. Must be bad. Which is inaccurate. And that's what's frustrating is it's a very sort of common group thinky way to approach this type of topic or discussion. And it does a disservice to the greater tech community as a whole. Because now you're gonna have a bunch of people that read this article or watched this video going, herp -er -derp -er -derp, said it was bad, with no evidence. And if we're supposedly into this stuff, if we're supposedly techies because we rationally consider the merits of these different devices, we should care about the data. We should care about evidence. And again, it's just sort of more evidence for me that this is really more the emotional bandwagoning 
than any type of rational discussion about our favorite hobby. <laughs> Simon says, Hypno, mm, it feels melting in my hand. <laughs> uh, undergirding, I love that word. It's a very Futurama, like, uh, like I, I wish I could do a good bender uh, voice uh, uh, mimic. Uh, girding, it's a fun word. Ah. Uh. So, um, that's all I have to say about that. The other thing that's coming, uh, Samsung, is uh, apparently tomorrow we're going to be getting a Galaxy Z Fold 2 proper unveiling. That's what Engadget is saying. Uh, proper unveiling. Unpacked Part 2 starts at 10 a.m. Eastern next Tuesday. Well, I mean, that was last week uh, when this article was posted. It's coming tomorrow. Uh, over under. All I want to do right here, I, I'm not super hyped on folding screen phones. I still think that's way too fragile, too many compromises for a true productivity device. And it becomes more of a, you know, a, a sort of a, a fashion flex more than anything else. But um, over under, what are we thinking Galaxy Z Fold 2 is going to come at, come down to? Uh, do we think Samsung is going to arrive at 1999? I believe we could see a base model start at 1999. Um, I'm curious to see if they're going to come out with a 4G, 5G split with the 865. It's kind of anyone's game if they're going to uh, activate. But I, I'm, I'm thinking it's going to be a 5G only device. And I'm, I'm pretty confident that there's going to be a variant you know, for more storage and RAM um, of the Z Fold 2 that's well over $2,000. What are we thinking? Over, under. Give me give me some numbers here. What do we think a Galaxy Z Fold 2 5G folding screen phone with the enhanced front-facing display is going to cost? Uh, Mike is saying $2,099. Dave Burns is saying $2,400. $2,400. I'm thinking $2,400 will be the high end. So like, let's say they release one at, with 128 gig and then they release one with 512, you know, again, whatever the numbers are for storage and RAM and all that stuff. Gary, the fireman backing up Dave Byrne saying 2399. Um, I'm, I'm thinking pretty high. Uh, Raymond, it's saying 2199. Matt Tyler. Okay. This is a, uh, this is the unpopular hot take base model fold to 1899 with options going up to 2399. So that, that could be, that could be a thing. Dave Burns, uh, he, if, if we think that the high end, that the top end model is going to be like $2,400, uh, they're saying a terabyte of storage in the high end of the new fold. I would love to see a phone with a proper terabyte of storage built in would make me so happy. Uh, Winston saying $2,499 for a Tom Brown edition. Again, a fashion the, the the fashion version of your fashion flex phone, your statement phone, uh, being even higher. I, I I buy that. I bet Samsung could put us up there. And Gabaletta saying, I'm sure it'll cost $19.99 at the very least. But Saeed, uh, Ted saying $17.99 for a base model. I'll be really curious to see. Um, component costs are higher. Manufacturing costs better be higher because the Fold 1 was was sort of a mess. Um, of very poor manufacturing and design decisions. The new front screen being larger is probably more expensive to manufacture. Um, it, I'm positive it's going to have 5G. We have to look at power management with 5G and the 865. So I, I'm, I'm pretty confident that we're going to see, my, my, my guess is top end model $2,400 with options cheaper. That's my guess. So we're going to catch it tomorrow. <laughs> Simon says, Hypno, two firstborn kid souls and one kitten soul. <laughs> I mean, that's that's the trade-in market, right? That's that's what you're going to get for a trade-in. <laughs> Dave Burns, if it costs more than a, than an RTX 3090, I will be perplexed. Uh, we, we, what was it, Zotac? Uh, we just saw details on the next generation of GPUs from NVIDIA. <laughs> Gary the Fireman, $3,399 for a McLaren edition. If that comes in carbon fiber, I'm all for it. <laughs> make make my phone out of something carbon fibery. Um, <laughs> that's hilarious. 
So uh, let me get this out of the way here real quick again. You know what? I put this on the on the list. I don't. Does anyone really feel like talking about the Amazon Halo? It's a fitness band. It does fitnessy things. It doesn't have a screen. Amazon has all of your data and all of your health data. They make you do a body scan where you have to like put yourself in front of their camera so they can scan your whole body and form fitting clothes. And then it also like measures your voice stress because AI and voice stress analysis. Is anyone, is, is anyone digging this? No? Yes. It's going to be cheap. It's like 65 bucks to get one. It just looks like a strap. There's no screen. It just rests against your arm kind of awkwardly. And then if you want all of that extra health and fitness tracking stuff, it's four bucks a month. Anyone? No? Okay. <laughs> I got a request to talk about the LG wing. Does anyone want to talk about the LG wing? Let me, uh, oh, no. Let me pull up something on the LG wing. Uh, like Ars Technica has a, has a pretty good, no? Yeah, no one wanted to talk about the Halo. Okay, real quick, LG wing. I am on board dual screen. LG has won me over for dual screen productivity and multitasking. I'm a little concerned about the wing. This is from Ars Technica's article where someone showed it off in public where you've got like a map and then media controls. Basically, the, the front screen swivels sideways to create a T-shape. And some of the things that we, we've been looking at are using that skinny part of the portrait base phone as like a keyboard, and of course, everyone pops out like LG used to make these like swivel screen concepts with uh, number pads. So you'd have like media controls under the phone screen, you'd swivel the screen up and you'd have a dialer, you know, a number pad. Um, the, the example given in, um, in, in their sort of analysis here is using navigation on the big main screen and then media controls on the little square screen that lives underneath. Um, I am a huge fan of dual screen. I love dual screen. I am I'm regularly using V60 and Velvet and kind of going back and playing with 8X and, and V50. But one of the things that makes me a little bit more comfortable with dual screen from LG is the fact that it's a part-time solution. That like, if I bust the, the dual screen case, I mean, it sucks because it's expensive. That is an expensive case, but I can go and buy a new case and the case will probably do a pretty good job of protecting the phone. So when I when I look at the wing where these this is a, a a fused concept, this hinge is built into the phone. It's a permanent part of the phone, and there's a screen that lives under the main display. The manufacturing makes me a little nervous. You know, like one piece of sand gets stuck to the back of your main screen, and then you swivel this closed, and you've just you've just gouged the screen underneath. And then if anything happens to the hinge, you can't really replace the phone. That's all built in. I mean, it's gonna be the um, it, it's gonna be the same critique. It's gonna be the same concern for any phone with moving parts. Um, but I really want to see how this is implemented because, I mean, that's that's the biggest concern. Again, when I look at eventually getting my hands on a Surface Duo, my big concern is having two screens permanently attached to a very thin device. And I wanna know that this is gonna be a durable consumer product and not just some kind of fashion phone exercise. <laughs> Dave Burns, I hate sand, it's coarse and it gets everywhere. So, but I mean, the rest of this makes sense. You know, you have the same phone layout, your rear cameras are on, excuse me, the back of the, the body of the phone, the screen swivels out. I love the idea of having like a portrait keyboard while you've got a vertical app in landscape. I think that's pretty cool. Um, especially if you don't like kind of reaching, you know, for the full width. You know, if you hold up a, a velvet and you're trying to do thumb typing on the full width of the screen, maybe that's not your thing. You can just have like a portrait sized thumb, thumb board right there. Uh, it could be cool for gaming where you have more of like a Game Boy style controller interface on that second display. And then just more screen is always better. I, I mean, again, I, that, that is one of the, the things we're trying to work towards with folding phones, 
having more screen, having some way of putting more information in your hand at any given time. Um, I, I'm concerned about a permanent hinge, though. I really want to see LG's solution for trying to keep uh, keep that working well. Like, I just imagine taking this to the beach. I, I made the mistake of taking my V60 in the dual screen case with me to the beach. And as soon as I got there and I realized, like, oh, there's no way I should bring this out on the sand. I put it in a Ziploc and I sucked all the air out and I wrapped it up and I put it in a towel. <laughs> it was like, I'm going to try and baby this phone as hard as I possibly can to make sure my dual screen case doesn't get wrecked on the beach. So, so that's the gig. I, I, I'm hoping it's cool. I really want some more funky experiments and some, some cool, um, some, some cool hardware, but that that's one where even for my love of LG, I'm, I'm, I'm a little concerned with the execution. One thing I'm not concerned with, and one thing I'm really excited to see is some news on an Xperia 5 Mark II. Might be Sony's first phone with a 120 hertz display. So it's a, it's a 1080p uh, pixel density, or a tall 1080p. And then a lot of the same specs as the Galaxy, uh, the, the Galaxy, the Xperia 1 Mark II. Um, we might get 4K 120 frame per second re video recording. So that's a rumor. I haven't seen anything confirming that. Uh, we might get a 120 hertz OLED panel. That's still a rumor. I haven't seen anything directly confirming that. But it's the the sleek, sexy build. It's going to be a little bit smaller than the uh, the big boy Xperia 1 Mark II. And I think it also, it's probably going to lose one of the depth sensors. So there was an additional camera sensor on the Xperia 1 Mark II which we're not gonna get here on the Xperia 5. But if this starts landing in that sort of $800 price range, uh, premium built, Sony, it's gonna have a headphone jack, uh, no weird cutout or notch because those are dumb, a really pretty screen with a faster refresh rate, I'm on board. I like, again, just like I like the Xperia 5, um, going Xperia 5 Mark II. This is, this is a good back and forth. Like I, I wanna see some more options and hopefully, some options that are a little bit smaller for 5G devices. Um, <laughs> Dave Burns. But some gadget guy, the camera app is unforgiving. <laughs> the camera apps are awesome. <laughs> I mean, again, there's a part of me that wants to be really snobby and gatekeepery. Like, if you can't take good photos with an Xperia, um, you suck at cameraing. Just get good. <laughs> get good at cameraing, and you don't have to worry about the Xperia cameras because. Those apps are awesome. <laughs> and Mike, I completely agree. We do need more smaller phones, but in the age of early 5G, I don't think we're going to get a lot of options um, for newer and more premium built devices. You know, I, I think we'll see a bunch of iPhone SE and uh, Pixel 4a competitors, but the high end are all going to be real big with the 5Gs. All right. And so um, I want to wrap this up as we're getting into kind of the last 15 minutes here of, of the podcast. Um, I wrote an article. This is the first time. This is historic. This is a big deal for my podcast. This is the first time an article from somegadgetguy.com has made the show notes for my own podcast. So uh, I'm pretty proud of me. You know, like I finally, I finally reached... Um, a tier of editorial that I felt was worthy of including in the main body of the show and not just for some part of uh, housekeeping. <laughs> Q3 Becker, here at SGG, we invent words to better bully and gatekeep. <laughs> True story. Um, a major part of my review commentary since leaving Pocket Now has been to talk about, um, much to the chagrin of people who like popular devices, but has been to talk about some of the media literacy issues facing this industry, my industry, how, how I work and pay bills and put a roof over my family's head and eat food. Um, there are some very concerning trends in how we talk about gadgets. We like to pretend that there's this sort of honorable meritocracy of uh, this gadget is really good and it got good reviews and now it's popular and consumers seem to like it. And then this is all just, again, through the pure merit of making a good product. And I do not believe that that's the case. I don't think it's a coincidence that in, in any given region, 
the top selling devices almost exclusively come with the most aggressive spending on advertising. As much as we want to claim that there's some sort of rational and consideration for the devices we buy, buying the new shiny is often more an exercise in emotional fulfillment than rational consideration. You know, like uh, we decide we like this brand, we decide we like a handful of features, but we push but we push go on this through a more emotional uh, relationship with our technology, and then we kind of backtrack it, and then we come up with the reasons for why we like a certain product. And I think we see that exemplified in the more toxic communities surrounding manufacturers like Samsung and Apple. When you push back against you know, the enormous advertising spending from a company like Samsung, you get very angry people who have decided that the Samsung label is a part of their lifestyle identity uh, coming to criticize your channel for being a hater. Um, I, I get very uh, angsty comments from Apple fans that I'm being mean to Apple fans when really I'm criticizing Apple. I feel there's a difference between talking about a $2 trillion company and the individual humans who might use their products. And if we can't separate that, then there's a huge problem, right? Uh, if, if someone can't rationally uh, divide the commentary on Apple as a company and Apple users as humans, then the reality distortion field has warped their perception of how people should interact with each other and how they should define their lifestyle. So I have concerns. I've had concerns for a while, and I try to talk about those concerns on the regular because media literacy is a huge part of some of the challenges that we're facing as a community, as a society. You know, when we look at the pull that social media has on political discourse, on you know, uh, consumerism, on waste, on right to repair, on net neutrality, on connectivity measures, and how many people are left out of those discussions that deserve to be a part of those conversations. But really, the, the big highlights are always who can kind of spend the most to get their message out there. So that's always been a part of commerce. But in my industry, I feel like there used to be a, a better accounting for smaller, less popular topics. So you, know, you put out a video on Samsung, and Samsung is popular. That video does really, really well. And, you know, advertising or sponsorships, you make money off of that. Then that helps subsidize your conversation about less popular topics and less popular gadgets. But in this era of algorithmic manipulation of people's feeds, if you put out a video that does not perform as well, YouTube actively gets in the way of you and your subscribers. I, the number of comments I get from people who smashed that bell icon but still don't see the videos that I produce. So now, in this era of manipulated content feeds, we can't rely on a, a handful of Samsung and Apple videos properly subsidizing conversations on less popular manufacturers. And to that same token, those less popular videos start to harm our channels and our platforms on Google search and Google rankings and SEO. Oh, well, your last video didn't perform as well, so we're not going to push your next video as aggressively seems to be the mechanic at play. So I'm getting to a point here. Um, and, and again, to that same token, when we know that Samsung is putting billions um, I believe their last year ad buy was around $10 billion um, just for advertising. That's marketing. Um, I, I have to believe that a fair amount of that also happens on the web. So when someone says something nice about a Samsung product and Samsung starts cutting together influencers, yeah, maybe no money was exchanged. So a popular YouTuber doesn't need to say hashtag sponsored, but they derive a phenomenal monetary benefit from saying nice things about Samsung. I believe they're honest that they like those products, but I don't believe that Samsung has really earned their position as being the de facto choice in Android land as much as they bought it. 
they they bought their way into being the sort of biggest mindshare manufacturer of these products. <laughs> and from Mike, I wish I could turn the algorithm off. We all do. <laughs> I, I, uh, anytime I see a manipulated content feed, I stop using that platform. Like it's destroyed my interest in Instagram, but now I'm just repeating myself. So Surface Duo is coming out. Surface Duo is in the hands of a number of really large YouTube creators. But this is a phone that I feel like most armchair quarterbacking techie reviewer wannabes, uh, those nerds, and I'm saying that, you know, derisively on purpose. Not If you're a nerd, cool. But if you're a nerd, that's bad. <laughs> um, I feel like this is, again, something that people made up their minds on emotionally. It's not out. People haven't been using it. They haven't been holding it interacting with it but specs aren't good enough too expensive nerds that's not a fair review process right it, it i mean again i'm hoping to go hands-on with the duo uh in in about a week maybe a little bit longer and it could suck it, i mean it really could it could be a bad first generation product i don't think it will be i just think it's going to be a tough pill to swallow in an era where people are tired of paying too much for phones but I think it's going to bring some really unique stuff to the table. That's a nuanced conversation. Someone looking at the specs and then saying, oh, it's too expensive. You don't get enough. It's not worth it for the monies. Like they're educated on the topic of reviewing technology. That's a nerd. But we already know because this phone has been talked about for a while, because it's sort of a fascinating topic to dig into, Microsoft coming back to phones, dual screen versus folding screens. We don't have anything in this space outside of LG to really properly compare it to. This is, this is, this is Wild West territory here. Um, what's fascinating is seeing how Microsoft has adapted to that commentary. I feel like this is something that a lot of uh, marketing departments have failed on is they want the big views, right? You know, like I want to get this, this phone into the hands of a YouTuber with like 10 million subscribers. And man, look at all these impressions and look at all these hits. Whoa, our numbers are great. But then you go and watch the video and it was someone not really using the product, not really reviewing it, but telling their followers why they shouldn't buy it. So we already knew the game plan. I wrote an, edit an editorial that was published on Windows Central. Um, and, you know, again, I think I did a pretty good job of predicting what the main detractor points were going to be from, from folks trash-talking the duo before it was out. I think it was pretty clear to see these were the points that everyone was going to complain about instead of looking at what the Surface actually brings to the table. I'm going to write it off because of the price tag. I'm going to write it off because NFC. I'm going to write it off because the battery is too small. Even though I haven't used it, I have no idea if the battery life is going to be good. I'm going to write it off because Snapdragon 855, even though no one's really maxing out a Snapdragon 835. But sure, that matters to no one <laughs> when they really put their phone in their hands. Great. You keep up with that. So yeah, I've even written some, some emails to Microsoft PR I am getting, you know, uh, completely silent, uh, no replies. Um, Microsoft has no interest in talking to me about these products, but their reaction to this is nothing short of genius. If you know how all of these online tech influencers are going to trash your product, then make the first round of videos focus on things that they can't trash you on. And that's brilliant. So I wrote this article. The, the, the image is folding up influencers. Um, the title of the article is How Microsoft is Gaming Influencers and Algorithms with the Surface Duo. So here's the deal. If you've been following Surface Duo news, then you saw in your YouTube feed a bunch of unboxing videos just hit, right? Last week, early embargo, first wave of embargo, Unboxing, 
first impressions. Let's look at the Surface Duo. So exciting. Look at this reviewer's package where I also got some Surface Buds. I'm so excited. Listen to the tone of my voice. I'm opening up the new Shiny. No one else has this phone, only a handful of, of online content creators. And not a single one of them turned the device on. None of those videos showed anything about really operating the device. So here's the deal. Surface Duo looks like one of the most radically impressive feats of manufacturing and component assembly we've ever seen. When the phone is closed, it looks like it's going to be thinner than most of our premium 5G devices today. And when it's open, it looks like it's thinner than the camera bulge on a Galaxy Note 20. That kind of consumer-focused, ultra-slim manufacturing with hinges that I have to believe are really, really nice is ridiculously expensive to do well. That is something that contributes to the cost of the phone. And don't we know so many reviews would have casually mentioned it, but then like, oh, but it's not good enough because you can't do this with it. Oh, but I mean like, you know, you can't do like Qi charging. They would have skimmed over. One of the most impressive manufacturing accomplishments in the history of mobile gadgets, that's not worth it for your money. It's not worth it to spend more on a device that's manufactured to that kind of specification. One of the only things that gadget reviewers kind of agreed on with the Galaxy Fold, the first edition of the Fold, was how nice the hinges felt, right? You know, like a, a lot of varying opinions on whether or not that phone was groundbreaking or impressive or fragile or a cataclysmic failure. Everyone would kind of open and close it. No one has gotten this right for phones. A screen that wraps all the way, a hinge, I should say, a hinge with screens that wraps all the way around. It can fo fold completely closed, can wrap all the way around to completely open, 360 degrees. We've only seen it on laptops. That deserves a significant amount of consideration. You can, you can go through and say like, oh, well, I'm bummed about this one spec or I'm bummed about this Snapdragon. <laughs> Someone who's interested in shopping a Surface is likely interested in shopping an experience which reminds them of using a Surface Pro or a Surface Book or even a Surface Laptop. They want something that feels like it fits into the continuity of Microsoft hardware. And they want it to feel like something that's never been done before. And this is something that really has never been done before. But we know, we know that that's gonna be kind of casually brushed aside. So for Microsoft to approach these huge YouTube channels, but then put them under one of the strictest embargoes I've ever seen. I, I mean, I have to play ball with embargoes. When I get a review kit, you know, like, um, like I, when I got the V60, there was sort of like an early phase, and then there was sort of like a public phase. Uh, same thing with the Xperia 1 Mark II. There are cer certain things you, we don't want you to talk about in videos, but for you to have early access, you can focus on unboxings and first impressions and maybe a setup. Microsoft said, you can take it out of the box and you can open the device. You know, you can wrap the screens around on the hinge and that's it. And they knew exactly what they were doing because by eliminating any other ability to criticize what might have been in the phone or what specs might not have been good enough or what performance didn't benchmark well enough because Geekbench, the entire first wave of the biggest channels all focused on how exciting this, this unboxing experience was, how pretty all the packaging was, the emotional, I'm opening up the new shiny. Remember, we have an emotional relationship with our gadgets. And it forced all of those content creators to really particularly focus on the engineering of the device, something that would have been disregarded as not good enough or not worth it's enough for the money. And that's brilliant. Because we also know that second wave and third wave videos are not going to perform as well. The entire first rush and first batch of Microsoft Duo videos are going to highlight 
emotion, the, the high of unboxing, and the manufacturing. And right now, today, if anyone wants to, to learn a little bit more about the Duo or how it works or what it's like, then the next most visible video comes directly from Microsoft, where Panos Panay talks about the power. The, and and I, I'm, so, I'm so honored that you were along for the ride with me on the power of this device. I'm getting a little bit clamped. He's so emotional about his experience with a powerful Microsoft product. And all of their product demos are really smooth and sleek. And I mean, they did it live, but it was pretty controlled. But you get that glimpse of, if you want to see what this looks like, Microsoft will field that conversation for you. If you just want to hear people say nice things about it, all of these other YouTubers, all of these other tech influencers, they got to play ball with that embargo. I think it's brilliant. I think it's this is one of the most impressive media and marketing turns I've seen in years. Uh, this is coming from a company that really struggled with that brand ID when the Surface originally launched and looking like they actually learned those lessons where people would trash talk the Surface Pro, but then like months later go back and say, well, actually it was pretty nice after the initial damage had kind of been done for those reviews. This is, this is one of the savviest marketing moves I think I've ever seen and speaks directly to how manipulated our content has become, how, how gamed algorithms have made this product commentary that all of these tech influencers were so predictable that Microsoft set up this crazy embargo, cut the legs out from under the, the, the talking points that people were going to rely on to tell people not to buy this product, and then gamed YouTube for the early first views so that everything was as positive as they could make it. Hats off to Microsoft PR. That is crazy savvy. <laughs> um, <laughs> Sorry, I'm, I'm, I realized I was kind of monologuing there for a bit, so I'm gonna try and catch up on some of these comments here. Nam, I like Unbox Therapy review on that product. He did not say, say anything stopped about the product. But I mean, everyone, again, when, when you're working an embargo that strict, I, I don't, I still don't know of any major YouTube channel that has shown the product properly being used with the screen on, which is this huge vacuum for tech commentary. We're seeing smaller channels like people walking in to vlog at Best Buy or AT&T just so they can show the duo actually being used, you know, like major channels who have all the production value and all of the subscribers and all of this traffic are not able to show any of that off. And I, I bet you this embargo is probably gonna last through another week. Cause I believe Surface Duo is gonna start shipping out over the next couple days to people who pre-ordered. And once those pre-orders start shipping out, you're gonna see a second wave of Surface Duo videos. I'll be really curious to see if those Duo, second wave Duo videos perform as well for traffic and views as these original unboxings. Excuse me. <laughs> From Mike, it happened. This is exactly why I think this is so savvy. I just watched MKBHD's hands on and noticed how he tiptoed around saying much good, but hit it pretty hard with the camera and the old processor. So here's the deal you can talk about, oh, Snapdragon 855, oh, this camera can't show anything. You can't show anything. He can't show you that it's gonna be worse. So all of these things, I mean, we, we like to think that in the tech circles that consumers are considering the same things we are. They do not care. This was a major arguing point between me and Tank Girl on Miriam's podcast was, oh, but I mean, what they needed was optical image stabilization and this other higher resolution megapixel sensor. Consumers don't care, do not care. They are not looking at Snapdragon 855 to Snapdragon 865, their eyes have already glazed over. I mean, seriously, go, go to your great, great aunt Ida and start talking about manufacturing and chip fabrication and watch her eyes glaze over. 
there is no way for those consumers to conceptualize what the performance disparity might be from someone just casually mentioning, oh, it's got a Snapdragon 855. This is going to be way too expensive for that. Is it? Will they? You can't show it. Again, when, when speed tests come out and teardown videos come out and benchmarking videos come out, yeah, the gadget nerds are going to jump on that and hype it up and those videos are going to get a ton of traffic. And no one outside of those circles is going to follow up on that kind of content. The first wave, YouTube has primed this audience, has primed consumers for the big spike being the first wave of videos. And also, I mean, let's just be perfectly frank. The A55 is still a baller chipset. I mean, like I'm doing video rendering on Snapdragon 855s that rivals consumer grade laptops and sometimes keeps pace with gaming laptops. If we're looking at rendering to the same video quality, people have not maxed out the 845. People would be fine with leaner software on an 835. There is nothing about an 855, which is really going to hold people back or I'm really worried about the multitasking. No, you're not. <laughs> you're not. And let me tell you why you're not is because I'm surrounded by dual screen phones. You're not concerned about the multitasking on a mid-ranger chipset. You're not going to be uh, concerned about the multitasking on last year's premium chipset. Uh, Dave Burns, cough, Pixel 4, cough. Yeah, again, if you've been watching my podcast or my videos, the Pixel 4 XL still outperforms the iPhone SE and iPhone 11 Pro for video rendering by a decent margin. Like we're talking about a 10% faster video render in 4K. You're going to do fine on a Snapdragon 855. And this is coming from someone who actually does render video on their phones. <laughs> Dave Burns validating my venting. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, Aditya Nil, Juan, your insight into the play Microsoft made with the initial impressions was eye-opening. You're a really wise dude. Thank you for sharing that knowledge. Aditya, you're a really wise dude for commenting on my videos. I believe we're we're pals and, you know, it's it's good times. <laughs> Saeed, that's right. Uh, Saeed is saying the Duo is going to be available on Best Buy starting September 10th. Um, so uh, I, I, I mean, smart money would say stage two embargo reviews probably coming out on the 9th. Eighth or ninth. I think that's when our next wave of duo videos is probably going to hit. <laughs> Simon says, Hypno, first impressions count and favorable impressions without objective review create a false sense of, oh, this must be good. Which, yeah, that's kind of the point. I mean, we're talking about Microsoft having a vested interest in trying to sell as many phones as they can, building up an ecosystem, building up a user base. And I'm kind of okay with this being the fight is because there was no version of our timeline where the duo was going to really get a fair consideration for what it does. It was only going to be the whipping boy to show off the few things it lacked. I mean, think about it. Now that the duo, I mean, once the duo was announced, once the pricing was revealed, once the pre-orders went live, suddenly people started commending LG. LG now was, well, I mean, why get a duo if you can get an LG? You're literally seeing the operation of more popular gets better mindshare, gets more favorable coverage. Because before we had that commentary from Microsoft, before we had that disclosure, the pricing and the pre-order, I mean, LG's just not doing anything exciting. This, I mean, the Velvet's kind of nice. It's an interesting new font. It's really pretty. I, I mean, I can't point to a better example. As soon as SEO ticks better, is more favorable for one manufacturer, we see a direct trend towards reviewing it more favorably. That's not reviewing the device on its merits. Because V60 would have been reviewed a lot better on its merits if people had actually taken the time to use it, to craft nuanced opinions, to really put it through its paces, and that's not what happened. V60 and Velvet are now getting sort of a more positive mainstream conversation about dual display, but because there's someone lower on the totem pole 
for techies to point to as doing it wrong, too expensive, not worth it enough. Now, a Z Flip wasn't treated that way. Z Flip, Snapdragon 855, $1,300 phone, 4G only. Well, that was an interesting uh, direction for where we could go. It's, you know, it's expensive and it's pricey, but it, it could be a fun flex phone. Oh, I mean, I wouldn't recommend this as most people's daily drivers, but I mean, you know, this is, this is amazing engineering. Samsung always gets that sort of softened commentary. You can be super critical, but you always kind of like, but they're, they're being so ambitious. It's going to be so much fun for this. It's different because Microsoft deserves that too. Completely deserves it. $1,300 for a Z Flip at the beginning of this year versus $1,300 for a Surface Duo at the end of the year. And I'd rather have more screen. More screen's better. <laughs> uh, all right. <laughs> Saeed, uh, excuse you, sir. My Aunt Bertha will only purchase phones whose chips were manufactured by TSMC. <laughs> oh, that's hilarious. Um, Gary the Fireman, the old processor is what did in the Red Hydrogen 1. I disagree. I disagree. I think what did in the Red Hydrogen 1 was a ridiculously staggered launch strategy, overpromising on um, what the phone was going to accomplish, focusing on 3D where mobile 3D video content has never, has never succeeded, even back to the early days of HTC. And all of those technologies are expensive. So even though it only had a Snapdragon 835, no, no one rationally decided against purchasing that phone because only Snapdragon 835. There were numerous <laughs> other pain points on that phone. Uh, to walk away from not buying the red. Um, and, and again, that's also sort of a, a funny comparison because at least Microsoft has shown us that their hardware division is capable of improving in very important consumer ways. So again, no one's disputing that Surface Duo is a first-gen product and should definitely be handled with some kind of critical eye for being first-gen. But... We've also seen Microsoft make some important pivots to their laptop and tablet lines, making them more upgradable and more repairable. And so we see that this is an engineering arm that iterates on products tactically well and improves in very important ways. So, I mean, my general business productivity conversation will probably be focused on Surface Duo Gen 2, Surface Duo Gen 3, but I don't see anything wrong with someone wanting to play ball on first gen. I mean, as long as they are properly educated as to what they're getting into, this looks like a baller option for multi-screen multitasking. Like, it looks really good. Um, and I have every confidence that if Microsoft can survive through a gen two, uh, we'll see that iterative improvement like we've seen on tablets and laptops. <laughs> Matt Tyler, my nan refuses to talk about anything that's not an 865 plus. She says everything isn't good enough or worth it, worth it's enough for the monies. Your nan is very tech savvy. I'm, I'm proud of you. You've been you've been spreading the gospel. <laughs> um, ER 1980, the techiness in me is more excited to see what the fourth gen Pixel Neural Core will bring to the Pixel 5 and to see the generational leap from last year's Pixel 4 and the progress towards their own SoC. Again, I mean, again, we, we talk about stuff like that. Oh, Pixel 5 is basically just going to be the same. And you're like, no, we don't know that. The neural core, I'm, I believe the neural core is what's responsible for making the Pixel 5 one of the most beastly capable phones for chewing up image data. And if that's in a mid-ranger phone, like that could be the first 765 that can shoot 4K at 60 frames per second. If neural core is able to offload the heavy lifting as a DSP. That would be huge, especially if they land like six ninety nine. Even pushing up into seven ninety nine is a bit of a stretch, but man, there's so much potential there. That phone could be real good. 
But again, they'll look at, oh, it's only got a 765G and it doesn't have an 865, so it's not worth it for the money. And you would miss the, the fact that if you edited a video or if you manipulated image data in a photo, a Pixel 4 XL will crush OnePlus 8 Pros, LG V60s, and Galaxy S20s on an 865. I have not tested an 865 Plus, so I don't know if the 865 Plus has finally caught up to the Pixel 4, but you're missing, if all you do is look at the synthetic benchmark on Geekbench, you are not educated as to what this phone can really do. You are misinformed as to what this phone can really do. <laughs> oh yeah, some people talking about like previous LG video and dual screen videos and some other mess. Um, <laughs> from Mike, yeah, Pixel 5 is getting trashed on our Android. Again, a lot of people who are very confidently secure in their opinions when oftentimes those opinions are usually not uh, completely correct. <laughs> and yeah, because they're trashing it up based on rumors and specs. Um, you know, as, as my buddy TK Bay likes to say, um, and I'm probably misquoting him a little here, but I think I believe the sentiment rings true is benchmarks are not real life. And the way that we review phones has fallen into this lowest common denominator pattern, which is now proving to be so irredeemably predictable that marketing agencies are starting to take note. PR is starting to figure it out and they're figuring out ways to really game how we consume this content. And that's an exciting cat and mouse game. I mean, again, I'm, I'm morbidly fascinated at how the behind the scenes works. But again, we've got major consumer considerations for how this stuff goes down. And we should be concerned. But that all comes with media literacy. It's knowing how the sausage is made so that when you decide to put your faith in someone talking about this stuff or you're using them to help motivate a purchasing decision, you know where they're coming from. I, again, like we can make all the jokes you want. I am telling you up front, I like these devices because of how I work. LG, Sony, they afford me capabilities I cannot get on other platforms. You will see LGs and Sonys in my hands more frequently as the device I'm using in that moment than any other player. At the same time, I'm also directly telling you that if you don't work like me, you might want to consider some other type of product. Call me LG shill all you want. I would really like to see more YouTube content creators, especially folks with much larger channels and much higher reach than I have, have a practical sit down with their communities to say, this is what's up. This is what I do. This is how I do it. Because right now, the only thing I can point to is a general trend towards popularity influencing how that final review comes down. I see too many channels, huge audiences, never talk about what they really do on, on phones. I can't find any compelling use for dual display. Really? Like, you didn't try? Well, I tried doing like two apps at the same time. And did it work? We're, we're full of these incomplete assessments and opinions as if they're some kind of verified objective conclusion. And that's not how any of this stuff works. Now, I'm preaching to the choir, especially if you're watching a podcast like mine. You're, you're probably savvier than the average bear. And you like getting a bit cranky about this hobby, about this passion that we have for mobile electronics, consumer electronics, tech, and politics. I, I, I know I'm kind of ranting here again, but we need to extend this to people who are more on the periphery of our industry, people who are only casually interested in this kind of stuff. And then we, we really do need to get some of this messaging out to folks who spend their hard-earned money on devices that they don't need. I, I, I am telling all of my family and friends, why aren't you considering an iPhone SE? Have you checked out a Pixel 4a? I mean, yeah, you want a nicer screen? I mean, there's this funky company called TCL and they make TVs. <laughs> you know, like, 
we're getting these options. We need to talk about them and do better than just pay lip service to, oh yeah, I mean, if you want to use something like that, I guess you could save some money. But now let me show you another video on the Galaxy Note 20 Ultra. We need to do better than pay lip service. So, um, <laughs> from Mike, if Juan is a shill, what does that make the Samsung partisans? Um, and again, I, I want us to be careful because the commentary in the conversation isn't let's talk down people who like their phones. Um, I mean, I do that with some of my family, but I'm also going to say don't be like me because I can be a little insufferable too. Um, but it's it's always to raise the larger disc discussion as to how these companies do business. Someone who genuinely loves the Note 20 Ultra, I am not coming after you. But I have some significant concerns over how Samsung does business, markets their products, and interacts with content creators in ways that will never really be properly disclosed under current FTC guidelines. If I go to Samsung.com and I click on one of their videos and I see a mashup of popular YouTubers all saying nice things about their product, what's, what's the relationship there? What should be disclosed? Maybe no money exchanged hands. So, hey, no hashtag sponsored, no hashtag ad. But each one of those YouTube content creators got a significant monetary advantage for being on Samsung's nice list. So how do we detail that? How do we value that? What happens when one of those YouTubers makes another Samsung video, not directly connected to Samsung, no money exchanged. I don't need to disclose any, any benefit for talking about Samsung products. I have some concerns. I think we all should. So, um, <laughs> yeah, and, and Matt Tyler bringing up like a bunch of these manufacturers not, not playing nice with the UK right now. So I, I definitely feel you over there in the EU and the UK because it seems like every region has different phones and different uh, products that they get that other people don't get. So I, I think that's as good a place to wrap up as any. Um, real quick, I just want to see if there's been any any more political fallout from Dez retweeting my article here. Again, it really seemed to upset Michael Fisher, and I, I guess that's a bummer. Um, but uh, hold on, let me let me get this let me get this back. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, there's like a whole conversation going on. Um, Des, T-Mobile, would you have done it differently? And Michael, how do you feel about posting that type of content? Ooh, a direct interaction between Des and Mr. Mobile. I think I feel the same way most of us do. It's frustrating to deal with an embargo this restrictive, especially when retail devices are at Best Buy for people to point cameras at. It's also frustrating to be drawn into the hype trap and effectively used as a billboard, but... <laughs> Man, I, I gotta say, you know, Michael Fisher is not liking this uh, this kind of this kind of conversation, this type of uh, topic to discuss. So, I don't have a uh, Surface Duo to show you. Mine will arrive with all the rest of the plebes um, who had to buy them and and wait for a pre order to ship. And uh, I'll be way behind. You know, again, I, I'm also looking at this as like, I'm gonna eat $1,300 because my videos will absolutely not perform as well as these people who got first wave, who had early access, who were able to do their really fancy reviewer kit unboxings that average consumers weren't able to buy. And so hopefully uh, I can make some of that back, but I'm also looking at what market I'll even be able to flip a Surface Duo. Like if I sell it, I know I'm gonna take a bath on selling a used Surface Duo. So we'll have to see. Um, I'm hoping it's good enough that I just wanna keep it and use it as like a, as like a museum device, uh, some kind of like, a, you know, benchmark, uh, some, some, some sort of historical benchmark, I should say, that we can always keep pointing back to. Like maybe I should also try and pick up a, a, one of those Axon M's so I have a, a good collection of previous dual screen experiments, but you know, again, this is this is a painful, a really painful bit um, to chew into my wallet uh, to to play this. <laughs> DTNL, ooh, let me grab some popcorn. <laughs> Dave Burns, you got to prep your website for people trying to DDoS attack you. 
Um, oh, and a DTNL saying you got my back. We'll do the retweets and the hashtags. I, I, I mean, again, I crazy appreciate it. I'm not the type of person, I, I don't like buying devices and returning them. I, there's an ethical quandary I have with that. I don't have any problems with buying a device and selling it. Um, but I, I don't want to be that reviewer. And I think, again, I don't know why I've drawn that mental line there. I'm sure people would like buy it, use it for two weeks. But one of the things I really want to do is live with it. So if I buy it and use it for a week and I shoot a video and then I send it back, I think I'm doing the same disservice to talking about tech without knowing what I'm talking about. And I want to be better than that. So um, I'm just, again, it's, man, it's a big hit on the credit card. <laughs> so not super thrilled about that. But uh, I, again, I, I definitely, I very much appreciate uh, the folks here in the live chat for uh, for continuing to support and and push that commentary and help me share it or talk about the the other content creators that we see on our glowing rectangles. Um, it's it's been a really it's been a really challenging year for making tech commentary and then feeling like you're actively fighting the platform that hosts your content. So again, it, it is greatly appreciated having these conversations to start my week, engaging with a community of fun and like-minded tech pals and uh, continuing to talk about the stuff that we care about even if sometimes we have to dig a little deep in the weeds on like the politics of it or the marketing of it or the manufacturing of it, it's all a part of the same conversation. It's just different pieces of it that I don't feel are always um, highlighted as well as they should be. So um, folks, thank you so much for joining me. I, this, this was, I knew this was going to be a big podcast and one of the longer shows and we covered a lot. I mean, I was talking really fast to get through the, uh, through the news block. Um, so I, I, I really appreciate y'all taking the time, a chunk of your Monday. I'm sure you're all dealing with your own unique challenges with work and with life and with family, but I think it's the same situation that we've been in since the beginning of this shelter in place situation is we get to rise to this occasion. I'm so honored to be a part of this community for seeing the interactions of of all of the people in live chats like these where you are the good tech neighbors you're the ones that have the cup of sugar to lend to your neighbor that you know what you're getting into that you're trying to help people save money that you're trying to fit them with the right fit for them and not just whatever is most popular and that you're probably not appreciated as well as you should be for those efforts and I'll be the one to say it again. Thank you for being a good tech citizen. Thank you for being a good tech neighbor. Empathy, our tech empathy has never been more important than it is today as our family and friends have never relied on these gadgets like they have in the past. So keep up the good work. You're doing real good work. Keep it up. I'm proud of you. Uh, folks, you know where you can catch me around the rest of the internets, all on the uh, the Twitters, where my Twitter's blown up right now, and uh, the Twitch here and YouTube, and of course my website, somegadgetguy.com. Please keep supporting the other content creators over on reddit.com slash r slash glowing rectangles. I want you to have an amazing week. I want you to do awesome with your technology. I want you to be awesome with your technology, and I'll catch you back here next week. For another episode of the Monday Morning Tech Chat Show on the SGGQA podcast channel, be safe. It's still silly crazy out there. Be well. Take care. I'll catch you back.